Thank you so much, Derek. That really is one of the nicest introductions I've ever had. Um, our, before I move into my talk proper, I'll share with you um, a secret that Daniel knows, which is I found out that... I'm going to come out from her. I found out I was going to be director at Tate at three in the morning um, in the New Territories at the Jockey Club retreat up there. <laughs> my phone rang started me out of my sleep because the chairman, then chairman of Tate, Lord John Brown, had forgotten that I was in Hong Kong. He did know, but he'd forgotten what time I was at. And so I had to try and say with dignity, oh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that would be a great job, thanks, when I could barely speak. <laughs> And um, after a quite short phone call, um, where I um, conveyed my, my excitement once I'd woken up, um, the last thing John said to me is, you can't tell anybody about this, because I'm offering you the job, but it has to be approved by the British Prime Minister, you know, who takes her time to decide things, as we have seen <laughs> in recent times. So, and he, he, his final word was, don't even tell your mother. So I'm obedient. I hung up the phone, I screamed for a little while, and then I went back to sleep. <laughs> and I wake up the next morning with Daniel and colleagues, 25 cultural leaders from um, Hong Kong, China, and beyond. Um, and I come in and I walk into breakfast, and the whole room goes completely silent. And Sue Hoyle, our dear colleague who taught on the course, looked at me and went, is it true? <laughs> and I'm going, is what? <laughs> True. And she held up her phone and it was the front page of the Times. <laughs> and somebody had leaked it and the next thing was a text on my phone from my mother going, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> so I was, it was lucky that I was in Hong Kong and a few people in the audience were there with me at that time because I was not able to talk to anybody about the fact that I had been offered this job for another five days while Theresa May took her sweet time to sign the letter, when all the world's press were trying to get hold of me. But say, but fortunately, it's quite, um, it's quite secluded <laughs> up at the Jockey Club's New Territories place, so I was safe. So <laughs> Hong Kong looked after me at a very important transition in my life. So I thank this place for that. So I'm going to start um, with um, a bit of history, my, my career path, and then I'm going to move in the second part of my talk um, to share with you um, some of my experiences since I've been at Tate. Um, so I would say the first part of my talk is the none of us are born leaders bit. So I would say that in many ways I'm still extremely surprised to find myself here today talking to you about leadership as director of Tate. I wasn't taken to museums or galleries as a child, although I did come from a working-class family that encouraged reading and going to the theatre. I didn't do art or art history at university. I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge or the Courtauld for my master's degree. I did English literature and cultural studies here. In fact, we'll look at this as a bigger slide. In Liverpool, um, English and cultural studies at the University of Liverpool. I was a hard-working girl. You know, we were told to be. Irish Catholic family, you did your homework. Um, and I got three A's um, at A-level and a scholarship level. But I was also quite rebellious. I would wear my school uniform, but I would always wear odd-coloured socks. And I didn't go to Oxford, even though I could have had a place. Um, officially, my reason was that I thought it was too snobbish. But in truth, Having gone to a really quite grim, comprehensive school in a small Midlands town, I was intimidated by the idea of it. And I didn't know anyone around me who could have told me that I might have thrived there. Ultimately, I'm glad I didn't go there. I think I learned different lessons in this city. Alongside school and family, I was also a rhythmic gymnast when I was a young woman, young girl even. My mum took me to a gym club when I was five. I think largely to get me out of the house and so that she could make some new friends in a new town. I took to the sport and ended up being in the national team. I trained daily, often on my own before school started. I'd like to say I loved it. And in a way I did. I was proud of the things I achieved. 
um, and it was quite addictive and exciting. But it was also lonely and painful, and we were really regularly shouted at by our coach. You know, positive coaching methods hadn't been uh, invented in the early 1980s. But what I did learn from that experience was discipline of mind, body, and emotions combined with the importance of practicing things. So people often say to me, oh, you're a natural at public speaking. I can assure you, if you'd seen me when I was a junior lecturer in my first job, you wouldn't have thought that. But practice is something that the very best leaders do a lot of. I also learned something else um, that helped me at school and in life in general, which was that um, the push of doing something in spite of others. So I wasn't the best gymnast in the team, but I really wanted to be because my coach would sometimes tell me I'd never do something. So I had the energy of wanting to prove someone wrong and to achieve beyond a person's expectations. And though I think that sometimes leaves you with dark voices, um, those voices inside your head that say, am I really good enough? Um, I can see that across my own life, one of my biggest motivations has been to succeed when other people were telling me I wouldn't. And that might explain why I'm the first woman director of Tate. So I'll bloody show them. <laughs> In my childhood, another huge motivation was a desire to escape from something. So I loved my parents, and I had a happy childhood, really. But the town I spent my teens in was boring. And I was hungry for something that looked a bit more like the pages of the Face magazine. And in my wider family and friendship circle, I found some role models, a cool aunt and uncle who gave me David Bowie albums and introduced me to punk, and an impossibly glamorous pair of sports assistants at the sports centre I trained at who were DJs, and they'd been to Kingston Poly. So, they, and music in general, were um, a real encouragement for me. And I didn't feel like I belonged in this boring town. I think I had aspirations beyond, um, beyond my place. And I think that wasn't an entirely bad experience. And it persisted at university, even though I enjoyed Liverpool very much. I think it built in me a resilience to know that I could be OK wherever I was. And I can talk to almost anyone. And it's taken me many years to notice that this is a genuine asset to me as a leader and I think is one of the keys to getting on in the world. So, for my early life, I would say that um, I'd observed some positive role models for me and lots of encouragement from things that I did not like and so wished to change. And I think this is important because those things spur us on and drive us as leaders. It's not only the nurturing things in our life that help define us. So, I say, went to Liverpool. I went there because I supported the football team. <laughs> and I supported the football team because my father supports Manchester United. And I realised that age five, supporting Liverpool would be the most annoying thing that I could do. <laughs> it wasn't until I got there that I realised, um, something to my regret, that that was not a very good reason for choosing an English literature course. Um, and I rapidly uh, changed to a joint honours course where I did literature alongside cultural studies. The English course was really old-fashioned, though, and I was always in trouble with the tutors who wanted me to read 18th century poetry. And I was only saved by the inspirational examples of two rather amazing feminist lectures, lecturers, who I still know, and, um, and they encouraged me to specialise in feminist theory even though my context wasn't really into that. They encouraged me to get out into the city of Liverpool. Tate Liverpool opened the year I arrived there as a student, and I saw Darley's Lobster Telephone on my first day in the city. Completely blew my mind. By the time I got to my third year, I was lying on the floor of the gallery looking at a Richard Long in a very large circle, and um, thinking, I quite like this art stuff. So, the feminist lecturer encouraged me after Liverpool to go to Sussex University to do an MA in critical theory, which is where queer theory was born, really. Um, and with people like Homie Barber and Jonathan Sinfield and um, 
um, Jonathan Dollimore and Alan Sinfield. Isaac Julian came to talk to us. I thought this artist was astonishing. And there I started to feel like I belonged and through that became an academic, working first in London. Then I went back to Northampton, not for very long. I still didn't like it there. And finally ended up in Birmingham, the home of cultural studies. So I have an important point here. I had a 10 year career as an academic. I won research grants, I wrote two books, edited another one, had two children while I was doing that. Um, and some of my former colleagues, friends, are still amazed I'm not doing that still, after all that training. But I've had three careers, really, now that I think about it, quite distinct from each other. And I think the process of shifting sectors and having to start learning again how things work from the beginning has been a crucial part of my leadership development. I have some degree of comfort in leading and making decisions, even when I don't know everything. And I don't necessarily need to be the most expert in the thing that I am thinking about or doing. Given the pace of change that we live with as a norm in the world now, and the ever more complex work realities leaders have to deal with, this relative comfort with not knowing everything has actually been very important. So just to back to my career journey, so I mentioned whilst doing my PhD and working as a junior academic, I have my son, Jake, soon followed by my daughter, Lily. My closest friend, who is now a Pro Vice Chancellor in Manchester, and I, who we were junior lecturers together in Birmingham, we had two children apiece in three years. And we were the only people in our whole faculty that had children. A professor that we both worked for um, naturally assumed we were never going to come back to work. And I point this out, um, not just to say how appalling that was, but to notice how much has positively changed for women. But also because for me, learning how to juggle a baby, a career, my life and friendships is the most important experience I've ever had. I like to describe this as the Paula Radcliffe effect. UK's most successful female marathon runner, she ran the fastest race ever only nine months after having her first child. For me, as a not very well off working parent, I learned to do things with ruthless efficiency because I no longer had the luxury of taking as long as I liked to write a sentence or an essay or a lecture. A lecture. And I also learned that toddlers don't take no for an answer when it's time to play. And what I learned through that was that you as an adult become quite ineffective quite quickly if you don't have playtime as well as work time. So having the two children in quick succession made me focused and also flexible. Kids had to fit in around my work and the work around the children. And I observed that in many of the colleagues that I work with now and have worked with throughout my career, which is not to say that everyone must have children, God forbid, but I think it's an important point to make because I encounter younger women and men still now who are hearing that they can't have a family and a big job. When I think we all need the freedoms to make the widest variety of life and work choices, so it's not only about parenting, and in this current climate where systems of power and privilege are being very thoroughly and rightly questioned, you know, everything from the Me Too movement to um, challenges around gender pay gap and time's up and so on, I think good leaders in 2019 need to consider and model what diverse and distributed leadership looks like and how flexible organisational structures might help people live and work differently. If we think that my, gener my children's generation are probably going to have to work till they're 75, maybe 80, and they'll live till they're 100 or 110, we need to work differently and probably not so long and hard. And we need to evolve modes of um, uh, leadership that really challenge the kinds of power we used to see. So how did I go from being an academic to director of Tate? I've sometimes described this as a process of jumping ladders. 
progressing up one career and then jumping sideways. Um, I was halfway through my academic career or part way through and actually I'd got bored. Uh, a wise female mentor, however, gave me a better metaphor than the ladder. She said, why don't you think about it um, um, rather like climbing up a tree? You can go up one side to a very high branch, amazing view, left field, and then you can move laterally across to an equally, equally high branch, totally different view. I rather like that kind of alternative models, equally marvellous sort of analysis. Um, and that's certainly what I did. But I left academia because, not just because I was, I was spinning on my chair with boredom after having finished a book, wondering what I was going to do next, but because I actually found the relative isolation of academia then, I think that academia Derek describes is actually rather different now, but then I felt the isolation from the wider cultural world frustrating. And I'd also come to realise that my great skill was in motivating and engaging people. And sadly, this wasn't the most highly prized attribute in the academic world, although it probably should be. And I imagine in, in Derek's um, faculty, it probably is. So a good friend sent me a job advert for a programme called Creative Partnerships, which was set up after 1997 when New Labour came in, when we still had hope in the British political system. Um, the programme was tasked with bringing artists into schools and in my case I ran the programme in Birmingham and I assure you I had absolutely no qualifications to do this programme except that it was an action research project and they liked that I had ac an academic background. But when I thought about it, I knew the region very well, I knew the art scene, I had an aunt who worked in community arts and always had um, and so I interviewed for this job um, a thoroughly enjoyable experience because I thought they wouldn't give it to me. And then they did. And I was offered it as a secondment from the university. So if it went horrifically wrong, I still had a job to go back to. Um, and I think one of the things that we should remember is that perhaps we should encourage more risk-taking in the career choices of the emerging leaders within our organisations encourage them to go for things they think they won't get. Because actually, I realised I was my worst critic, my harshest critic. Other people could see in me things that I wasn't recognising. So I was thrown into this new environment. It was fantastically exciting. We had £2 million a year to spend to make artists do things in schools in really economically challenged parts of Birmingham. But it was the hardest and most intensive job I've ever done as hard as taking on Tate. Because spending public money well and quickly is actually really difficult. There were 16 test areas set up across the country. None of us knew what we were doing because we were trying to do something new. And we were work working with close government scrutiny. I remember one horrific evening walking along a beautiful beach in Cornwall, where one of the other creative partnership areas were, with Alan Davey, who went on to run the Arts Council, but he was then Chief Civil Servant to the Minister of Culture. And he asked me, um, we were watching a 500 young person strong performance on a beach that involves some boys surfing in and some dancing JCBs making giant sand castles with Motion House Dance Theatre. It was pretty epic. And he said, so can you tell me what the cost per body this, of this is, Maria? I think he came to regret that question later because I teased him about it a lot when I went to be on the Arts Council board. But I had to make the case to government ministers about the value of the arts. And I look back now and realise that much of the resilience, determination, creativity, persuasion, bloody-mindedness, good humour, empathy and passion that are needed for good leadership was forged through that role. It was completely terrifying, really exhilarating, and what it made me understand was that I, it, it matters to me that my work makes a difference in the world. And so because it was affecting the lives of young people in the city that I lived in, I really, really thrived there. And I think there's a related leadership lesson, which was that actually it helped me in many ways that I didn't know what to do all the time 
that I hadn't got all the background because I wasn't then bound by what I was supposed to do because I didn't know what you were supposed to do. So I was able to think more radically about what we could do. And that's a huge advantage in the current climate where change is a constant and culture and society um, is accelerating in highly unpredictable ways. But there is another kind of more measured um, lesson out of, um, from this. If you're going to operate in that kind of environment and make those sorts of leaps into the unknown, you have to put some serious support in place to work beyond your comfort zone. Some of my fellow directors on that programme burnt themselves out, couldn't cope with the continual requirement to make decisions without having the whole picture. I was fortunate to have been interviewed by somebody who was far enough along in their own career to say to me, you must get a mentor, you'll need a coach, make sure you go on your holidays. And I have kept some of the people that did the claw the ACLP programme with me here. No, I say that to the people that I work with now because it's vital. Um, the idea of a steep learning curve, which is one of the ways people describe these incredible transitions, is actually just a polite phrase for really bloody scary change. And when you're going through that, you need champions and fellow travellers as well as friends and family to get you through. Anyway, having had that experience. When the CLAW leadership programme in the UK was announced in 2004, I applied to be part of the first cohort because clearly I had become addicted to doing new and unfamiliar things. And it was, it was the next jump in my career. It helped me build a community of peer adventurers from across the arts. It brought me to Hong Kong to meet many of you, which I am eternally grateful for. I went into the CLAW programme, still a bit an, of an academic, um, having developed an arts education programme. But after completing the year, I was headhunted to be the director of the Whitworth Gallery in Manchester, never having worked in a gallery or a museum before. In getting the job, I also left my first husband, moved cities with my children, moved their schools, started the job, began a new relationship with a man who is now my husband, who was also on the CLAW programme. And I can honestly say, looking back on that year, I would never, ever recommend doing all of that at once to anyone. <laughs> it was horrific. But it brings me to my next observation. I got through that immensely difficult period of emotional, cultural, political and geographical change by asking for help. When I left my job in Birmingham, my very good Arts Council boss, Sally, made a lovely speech where she said, one of the best things about Maria is, though, is that though she is annoyingly capable, she's also somebody who knows her own weaknesses and is skillful and relaxed about finding people and asking them for help. I was surprised and really honored that she said that. And I have tried to hold on to it for the rest of my career. Ariane, my lovely colleague from Tate, knows this. this last two years has been another one of those steep learning curves and I ask for help and I have an amazing team around me and I've drawn on the strength of the leadership network that Claw is to help me when things have felt very difficult and in building those drawing on that help you build networks that are also friendships but they become vital to your success as well as your survival. The time that I had in Manchester, after getting the job as the director of Whitworth, um, took me through, as Derek said, the Whitworth Gallery, then Manchester Art Gallery, and then the director of culture for the whole city. It was an extraordinary um, uh, creative time and also a very good training ground for the role I'm in. I worked for artists, I worked with artists throughout that period. I be no built my people skills even further and became known as somebody who loves and champions what artists do, the disruption that they bring into the world. I also became known, somebody, known as somebody who was good at finding the money to realise those extraordinary artistic ideas. Um, and I think my third great um, learning was um, that I became very good at arguing for the way in which 
arts can enrich our lives. So I got to take on three roles in the end in Manchester because the powerful council leader could see I was a passionate advocate for the city and the creative change they were trying to make there, which is very similar to the kind of transformation Hong Kong has been um, engaged in for the last 10 years. I also learned masses from him, a very, very powerful political leader, because um, I learned how to work with a headstrong, difficult leader, when to challenge them, when to keep my mouth shut. He took me through how to negotiate with government. I completed a major capital project where, while I was there, and I apologise, I haven't got all the images, but there were just too many to pull together. And I ended up securing £80 million worth of investment for the city from central government because I'd learned from a master of negotiation. And what he really taught me was that vision and values have to go hand in hand. I've always tried to run organisations that are fun and exciting to work in, where people are valued and supported, with their different skills and contributions recognised, so that you can then ask a great deal of them. And they want to do it because they are working towards life-changing goals. And I can see now that one of my main skills is a capacity to tell a good story. And um, one that makes sense for people. And I think that one of the great leadership challenges is not dreaming up the vision. Actually, people have that in them. It's about how you gather it and focus it and share it with people so that it's the heartbeat of an organisation. Because the goals have to be human-sized, even if they are world-changing. The other thing I learnt in Manchester, a very social and convivial city, is that it's actually very good to be kind to people. I absolutely believe in this. It's massively powerful, much, much better than being ruthless. So I don't think kindness is a soft skill. In fact, and this sort of moves me into the second part of my talk, I think it's one of the new characteristics of leadership for now. And I want to see this attribute encouraged more in our workplaces, as well as in our lives. We live in very connected times these days, where collaborations across different disciplines are required nearly everywhere. So it really helps if people like you and want to work with you. So being nice doesn't mean you can't be tough and direct and ambitious and high achieving. And just a couple of months ago at Tate, I met the new director of the National Gallery of Australia, Nick Mitzvich. He said something that chimed with me. He said, I told my chair that I, of course I'm tough and focused and strategic, but I'm also soft and empathetic and I bruise like a peach in a lovely Australian accent. And he said, my organisation needs that too because we're dealing with people's thoughts and ideas and feelings. So please look after that soft bit of me. And I think in an increasingly adversarial, judgmental and absolutist world, one of the civic roles of the arts is to hold an open space for thinking. Thinking about the world differently, but also hearing differences of views. And that requires empathy and kindness to people who you might not agree with. So the only thing I will say about Brexit, I think, is that, of course, I get asked all the time for my political view. Journalists make assumptions about, well, of course, you are a Remainer. That's irrelevant to my job, because actually I want Tate to be relevant to the whole of the UK. And we are a divided nation at the moment. And one of our civic functions can be to hold a kind space for dissent rather than a hostile one. And I think that that's part of what arts and culture is all about. So having kind of gone through this experience in Manchester, when Nick Sirota announced he was retiring, I could just about see myself applying for the job. Couldn't quite see myself getting it. Um, but I was able to get it. And I want to be truthful and honest about that because I was hungry for the role, but there was another part of me that is still the girl that went to a rubbishy comprehensive school. The non-art history trained, non-curator woman who didn't look or sound like the next director 
of the world's most influential art museum. And I've been doing the job for two years, and I still worry about that sometimes. One of the things that has kept me going, even with those self-doubts, was the massive cheer from all sorts of people from across the world when I was appointed. And Derek's right, it's what really was about time they appointed a woman, not just to Tate, but to any national museum in the UK, because there hadn't been any ever. And the excitement about that was humbling for me and really cheering. But I want to say um, so very clearly that you, I don't think you ever stop doubting yourself. And that can't stop you either. So for me, I felt that although I was daunted, I was also excited. And the excitement about seizing possibilities about what you don't yet know you can do is actually how you help carry people forward with you. So, enough of me. My last bit is about leadership in the times we're in now. And of course, it's a cliche in the UK to say we're in turbulent times. God knows what we'll wake up to tomorrow morning. But if we look at Brazil or the US and Mexico and you know, across the world, we have um, a febrile social media environment populist politics, dividing people. We also have um, a kind of intergenerational and identity-led clashes of values and mores that you see through things like the Me Too campaign or calls to decolonize collections and restitute contested objects. There are, there's an increasingly confident um, voice of challenge and protest and agency and creative resistance, which I think is a great thing. But all the power structures are being challenged, which means it's not an easy time to be director of any cultural institution. And it's especially not an easy time to be a woman director of Tate. But in the face of this, I still feel mostly excitement because we are a public institution and we have to be in that public debate because it is our ground. As I said, an open space for dissenting experiences of art and culture. Because I believe this might entertain the utopian possibility that within our museums, strangers could come together through the experience of art and agree that disagreement is useful and is a part of the public conversation of how we would like society to be. I think that's what art and artists help us do. So rather than think that we exist in difficult times, and the wonderful theatre maker and gay activist Neil Bartlett, um, standing on a platform with me celebrating 25 years since Derek Jarman, the artist, died just a few weeks ago, said to me, you think the times are bad now? Some of us lived through the 1980s. <laughs> and it was a good thing to remember the Thatcher years in the UK. You know, there was lots bad going on now, but it was very, very hard then. So these are not only difficult times where the liberal values of the arts are being trampled on, I'd like to reframe things and say these are sensitive times where we urgently need to cultivate better listening skills and more empathetic codes of engagement. The role, therefore, of the art museum is to create a space premised on an ethics of care. Care for people, care for different views, care for the different ways that artists look at the world, and through that, expand the ways in which people can engage with art. If we can do this, I think we do justice to the nuance and complexity of artistic practice. But we also open up our spaces and our histories to more than one story, view, or idea. What we have to do however, to allow that to happen is give up some of our power. And for my generation of arts leaders, this is not as easy as I thought it would be. So, as you've heard from my life history, I've been very committed to social change, to forms of activism, to political engagement. So it hurts me now when younger generations point at me and say, but you're the establishment now. But the truth is, I am. Tate is. 
Derek said it, 120 years my organisation has been in existence. I stand next to Rufus Norris, the radical leader of the National Theatre in the UK, who also doesn't much like being told by his younger staff that he is part of the problem. But we have decided that what we have to say in response to that is not, you need to listen to me, but, OK, so tell me how I can stay in this conversation. And if we as institutions can expand the space for people to criticise us, to make that part of our own practice, if we can invite in people who are different from us, rather than only those who already like us, we stand a chance of challenging some of the worst parts of our political culture and the society that we live in today. So I want to grasp the fact that uh, we are part of the problem. Of course we're imperialist. We hold a colonial history in a post-colonial time. And if it's to become different, we have to accept our complicity and our wish to see it change. And we have to let other people, we have to let our publics, plural, start to shape the meanings that we wish to attach to art in the future. And we're starting to do that within the buildings at Tate. Not perfectly, um, and we are often criticised, but there are spaces now where other voices are being surfaced and heard. Some of them are artists, some of them are activist voices, some of them are people just having a powerful social experience on a Friday night. One of my um, young friends, a 22-year-old, and I won't embarrass him by naming him, um, comes to Tate on a Friday to meet his online dates. Because he said, he said it reflects well on me um, if we meet um, in a house of art. And I do not object one bit to that social use of Tate spaces. So we want pleasure an argument and conversations buzzing in the institutions that we run, because through that we will develop new practices and languages and ideas within the space of the museum. And those are the values that um, we, we kind of need to live by, a sense of openness um, and, and listening and attentiveness. Art. One of, our, um, one of our activist partners in Tate Exchange, which is one of the spaces where this kind of thing happens, said the, he said the following thing. He said, art is an invitation to a conversation. Tate, when it's open, can start to unlock that. And what I see in this is an integration of a social and an artistic mission that is, re is the key to our future relevance and our sustainability. So I see my vision for all of the Tates as a distributed national collection and as a globally connected institution is that we must be open and connected and generous. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how being open to the disagreements and critiques about how we do things will start to have an impact not just in our own institution but in our city and across the world. And as we do this, I think we'll start to change who comes to arts institutions. And for me, that's one of the key challenges of our future. We will be telling a different art history, much more plural and diverse, and I hope it will be heard and talked about by a much more diverse audience. I see colleagues from M Plus sitting in the audience, and I think they are also engaged in a similar experiment. And we will be working with institutions across the world who are learning to do things differently. Because as I see it, we have no option except to be in this turbulence. It is our terrain. But we have got to look after ourselves as we face these challenges. So again, my great colleagues at Tate have supported me when I've been in the heat of the storm. And I've needed that support. And in leadership terms, we should be honest about that need because it's about protecting our resilience. As Tristram Hunt, one of my fellow travellers, director of the V&A, wrote last year, he said, the spaces that we have are not straightforwardly political 
And as leaders, we're not political leaders of arts organisations, but we've got to be safe spaces to explore unsafe ideas. And I think this requires leadership with and through empathy. It means stepping into an uncomfortable and risky place. You've heard from me, I've practised that quite a few times through my career transitions. But it's never easy because it means embracing failure as part of learning and through that becoming more successful. And I think this is not only important, but I'm pretty certain it's just non-negotiable if we are to be of our times. So I would finish by saying that for me, I think in the arts, more than anywhere, we must create a larger space to think and act and dream differently because that's what underpins the art that we're engaged in and that's how that art can have the most profound impact on the world that we all live in. Thank you very much, everyone.